Very good evening to those joining us from India and the East. A uh, very good morning to those from the other parts of the world, particularly Tom and Jeffrey. Hello and welcome to the fifth JSJC commencement lecture. We come together today virtually, of course, to recognize your extraordinary achievement, transitioning from school to an undergraduate program for the ba new batch of JSJC, the returning students, and the class of 2021 who are leaving us for a new journey. An achievement made all the more worthy of admiration and celebration by these extraordinary times. I think we have all felt the same, a sense that things are spinning out of control with the flow of events, the scale of tragedy, and the intensity of that experience has overwhelmed all of us. But we must bear witness. That is why you are here at the J School. Nothing can be more important right now than developing the power of intellect. Never has it been so critical to shake the collective conscience of humanity by asking the right questions and by upholding free speech. It has been a good day for India at the Olympics, and it is an appropriate moment to invoke the Olympic motto, faster, higher, stronger, and together. The last word was added for this edition of the Tokyo Olympics. And I think the incredible story of the two high jumpers from Italy and Qatar exemplifies that spirit. Let me now invite our founding vice chancellor, Professor C. Raj Kumar, to deliver his address. Uh, good Thank you very much, Kishalai, and a very good evening to all of you, uh, particularly for those of us who are joining from India, and of course, Good morning uh, to our friends in the United States. Uh, let me begin by uh, welcoming our distinguished commencement speaker, uh, Mr. Jeffrey uh, Gettleman, and uh, uh, who has agreed to deliver the commencement address on a fantastic theme that he has chosen, the world's best job, journalism. At the outset, as Jeffrey being an American, I must say that the uh, commencement lecture has different connotation in this context. Typically in American universities, the idea of a commencement talk is when one graduates and there is an almost an uh, end to an academic uh, journey of a student. Uh, here in India and at Jindal, we use the word commencement as the beginning. And of course, uh, philosophically, one can argue that uh, the beginning is also part of an end, and end is also part of a beginning as well. Uh, having said that, I am very delighted that uh, Mr. Gettleman has agreed uh, to deliver the commencement uh, address, and uh, our Dean, Tom Goldstein, will formally introduce um, uh, uh, Mr. Gettleman. I would like to say that uh, this is uh, an extraordinary time when all of you uh, have chosen to join the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication. First of all, I would like to congratulate the students, the new students in particular, who have completed your high school studies. Uh, you have hardly been able to take a break, couldn't take a vacation, uh, could not do anything but uh, take another examination to be admitted to the university. And here you are, uh, you are you know, marching towards the beginning of the academic session, which will be on 16th of August. And, uh, and this has been a very difficult time. So uh, let me, first of all, congratulate you, but also appreciate your resilience, your commitment, your dedication uh, that has brought you to where you are today. Secondly, I want to welcome back our students who have been away during the uh, summer break and uh, welcome to all the students of the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication. Also congratulate the students who are graduating uh, for those of you who will be part of our virtual graduation uh, ceremony that will be happening on 7th August uh, 2021, uh, less than a week from now. As uh, Kishale mentioned, that never before in recent times, uh, we have been able to appreciate the extraordinary role that media as an institution and journalists as individuals uh, have played and, and did play during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I have been most inspired by their courage of conviction, but also a sense of fearlessness in reporting, even under the most difficult circumstances, being part of tragic circumstances, yet uh, to be able to bring the news from wherever they are. It requires a different type of grit and determination and a personal dedication to the causes that they expose 
to be able to do what journalists in India and journalists around the world have done during the pandemic. There have been, uh, you know, uh, what I call legitimacy crisis, a credibility crisis for media as an institution for a while. And this uh, pandemic has actually redeemed the role of journalists to a large extent, and they have also risen up to the occasion. Uh, that does not mean that uh, uh, this institution doesn't suffer from other challenges, like every other institution, it does have, it does face a number of challenges. But I also would like to say that there is no better time for young people to consider becoming a journalist. But I also want to use the word journalist in a much broader, uh, you know, understanding. It is not just working for a, a newspaper organization or a, a print or broadcast media. There are numerous ways by which one can perform the role of a journalist. In fact, one of the most extraordinary journalists of the last century happens to be Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi actually spent a lot of time writing and writing incessantly and sharing views and perspectives and including sharing news. And the heart of his role was to be able to speak truth to power. So in many ways, the role of a journalist is something to be able to speak truth to power, even under the most difficult circumstances. Um, there are different forms of threats that we face today, both internal and external, and democracies around the world are also facing threats due to the role of democratic institutions and to what extent they can function independently, autonomously, with a view to protecting the rights and freedoms of the people around. It is this responsibility that journalists as individuals and journalism as a profession is expected to fulfill. It's also equally important that uh, uh, one should be conscious of one's approach towards discovering the truth and also bringing the truth to the public domain. In this regard, journalists are expected to maintain high degree of due diligence a deep commitment towards integrity, personal and professional, but also a high level of rectitude. All those values are deeply embedded in the profession of journalism. It's also important to mention that today's age when the very notion of media and journalism is threatened by the, the financial framework under which it is operating, we need to look at new and imaginative ways by which this profession can be protected, preserved, and even expanded in the years to come. The students of the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication are increasingly going to inherit a world in which the, both the production, the dissemination, and the consumption of news is going to be through a range of platforms and possibilities. While there will be numerous temptations to adopt different shortcuts to even create that news and disseminate that news, it's important for you to recognize the fundamental responsibility of journalism and journalists, which is indeed to be able to strengthen the democratic institutions and instill in the faith among the people, citizenry, that one can hope to create a society based on the rule of law. Transparency and accountability are critical virtues that the profession of journalism needs to have and they need to get embedded in the very idea of being a journalist. These are indeed difficult times and I don't expect that everything that we aspire to do and to want the journalist to have can be taught in an academic institution. Nevertheless, the program that the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication offers, both in terms of its uh, academic framework its teaching pedagogy, the intellectual diversity, the interdisciplinarity, and the collaboration that it fosters, I believe will help you to become a well-rounded individual who will be interested increasingly in the way in which we want to build a society, a society that will indeed respect the rights and freedoms of individuals and advance the cause of democracy and good governance. These are aspects that one should be committed to, regardless of whatever one does in any walk of life. So to that extent, the program that the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication offers is broad-based, 
interdisciplinary and empowers students after a journalism degree to have a variety of pursuits including to be able to enter the profession of journalism we are very delighted that you have joined us and i look forward to personally meeting you sooner than later i know that uh, campus ecosystem is so critical for each one of you and we hope to uh, be in a situation sooner than later when we can physically welcome all of you to the campus you are also joining op jindal global university at a fantastic time when the university has been consistently ranked as india's number one private university and most importantly has been recognized as an institution of eminence by the government of india one of only 10 public and 10 private universities and the only non stem non medicine university which has been bestowed with that recognition this comes with greater responsibility for us to advance the cause of learning and i am sure your sojourn your journey at the jindal school of journalism and communication will empower you to fulfill your goals and aspirations it's also an opportune time for me to congratulate your parents and your family members all of whom have played a very significant role in your journey as you reach this important milestone of entering into the portals of an academic institution to pursue higher education i look forward to meeting you in person and once again welcome to the jindal school of journalism and communication of op jindal global university thank you thanks so much raj how did you uh, plan a speech which exactly fits the time that has been allotted to you uh, <laughs> now may i please request our founding dean uh, professor tom goldstein uh, to speak about the on the commencement uh, and introduce jeffrey uh thank you kish and uh i'm following the profound remarks of raj very inspiring it's now my special pleasure to introduce our commencement speaker jeffrey gettleman my friend who as South Asia bureau chief of the New York Times since 2018 has held down one of the most difficult and challenging reporting assignments of anyone anywhere with the greatest distinction energy and flair jeffrey has covered india and sought to explain it to the demanding audience of the new york times from a media centric view of the world He has become one of the most influential Americans living in India. Before being posted to New Delhi, Jeffrey served from 2006 to 2017 as East Africa bureau chief for the Times, based in Kenya. He won a Pulitzer Prize in 2012 in international reporting for his work there, and wrote a memoir of his time in Africa called Love Africa. Now let me give you some more background. Jeffrey just turned 50 late last month. Uh he grew up in Evanston, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago, and he graduated from Cornell with a degree in philosophy. After graduation, he received the prestigious Marshall Scholarship to attend Oxford, where he received a master's degree. At Oxford he became the first American editor of the student newspaper. He began his journalism career as a city hall and police reporter for the St. Petersburg Times in Florida, one of the best regional papers in the United States. He moved to the Los Angeles Times soon after and then to the New York Times. In all his reporting assignments he has been a gifted writer and an insatiably curious observer. I should note that his family, his wife Courtney, who teaches at Jindal Law School, and his two sons has accompanied him on his reporting journey. Uh he will speak to us today from his in-laws house in Saratoga Springs, New York, one of the great places to visit in the United States. So, over to Jeffrey and and he will ask he will talk for a while then we'll answer questions. Tom, Jeffrey. thank you for uh, a Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Tom Tom also worked at the New York Times a few years before I got there. Um 
And it's, uh, it's, it's really nice to see all of you. Raj, the university is a very special place. Uh, we feel lucky to be connected to it in two ways. Uh, my wife at the law school and, and my helping out when I can. Um, students, I wish I was with you guys. You know, it would be beautiful to see you in person. And we're all struggling with this virtual education. I'm a father of two sons uh, who are online and have been online. So <clears throat> I will do my best to, to convey the energy and excitement I feel for journalism through, through this screen. But I really wish I was looking at your faces now and feeling more connected to you. Journalism is the most exciting job. It is the best job in the world. Um, I feel very blessed and lucky and fortunate to have been doing this for so long and to have had the adventures that I uh, have experienced. Um, you can do good in this job. You can change people's lives for the better. You can ex experience amazing thrills and euphoria and you can see the world. You can learn about anything that you want to. You can talk to people of all walks of life. You know, in the same day, you can be talking to somebody who's living in a slum or working on a farm or fleeing a conflict. And that same day, you can be in the gilded halls of the president's office, speaking to the leader of that nation. There's very few jobs in the world that have that variety and have that span of human experience is the one that I have been doing for the last 25 years. I see journalism as a ticket to another world. I was sitting in my office in Nairobi where I worked uh, a few years ago and I covered 12 different countries in East Africa and, all, uh, and many of them were, were in a lot of turbulence. Anything could happen at any given moment in these places. And I received a call that a town in Eastern Congo was about to be captured by a rebel force and I had a few hours to get there. This is hundreds of miles away. I'm, I'm in, a, I'm in a, a different city, a different country, a different time zone. And I gotta get, get to this conflict before the border shut and it's too late and I'm locked out of a big story. So I, be, I rush home, I grab all my gear. I had a mosquito net, a satellite phone, a satellite transmitter, a first aid kit, a few pieces of clothing, my laptop, my cell phone, chargers, batteries, all kinds of cords. And I race to the airport. I fly to Rwanda first because the Democratic Republic of Congo, where I was going, there was no functioning airport. I had to fly to the neighboring country. So I fly to Rwanda and then I drive four hours as fast as I can to get to the border of Congo. When I get to the border, everybody is fleeing. I am the only person standing at this lone border post trying to get in to Congo. Everybody else is coming out. Civilians, desperate people with their possessions on their heads, families, crying kids, well-dressed people that need to, to leave because they're scared of the violence that's about to erupt. And I am literally the lone guy with a backpack and a computer case standing at the border saying, I want to go in. The border guards look at me like I'm crazy, but they let me pass. I walk, I'm, I'm on foot. This is one of these rare border crossings where you come from one country to, to the other by foot. I walk into this town and the sky is flashing like lightning, but I realize it's not lightning. It's the flash of artillery and bombs exploding. There's the sound of thunder. In all the hills around me, there are battles being raged with these rebels coming closer. I go to this one hotel where I had been to before and I knew the managers, I'd stayed there because a lot of these places that I covered in East Africa had conflicts that would rise and fall, rise and fall. And I had been there in peaceful times and in really dangerous times. And the manager says, I'll, I'll give you a room, but you have to pay me in cash because nobody knows what's gonna happen tomorrow. And I give him several hundreds of dollars and, and check into a room. The next morning I get up and we literally see these rebels marching into the streets. There's been a transfer of power. A government has fallen. This major city, it was Goma in Eastern Congo, which is right on the border, has, has, has fallen into rebel hands. Nobody thought this was possible. 
and the government officials and the army and the police, everybody has fled. There's nobody in charge except these young teenage and, 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 and soldiers in their 20s carrying machine guns and, and rocket propelled grenades on their backs, walking into town in their combat boots, looking around almost as shocked as everybody else. The next day, I have to get to another town because the, the fighting is, is raging outside of the city where I am and there's no way to get there. It's only like 200 kilometers away, but there's the roads are, to travel by road is suicide. Anybody could attack you. So I fight my way onto a UN helicopter. There's a, in, in, in these conflict zones, often humanitarian organizations in the United Nations are the only ones that can operate. And I fight my way onto this old Russian, kind of bubble shaped, M, I think it was an MI6, MI7 helicopter. They haven't been flying these for years. And it takes me to a town, Walikale, which is deep in the jungle and in the center of a very hot, dangerous place where there are gold mine, coltan mines, uh, different minerals that are mined in these areas and many different rebel groups and government forces fighting for control to get, to get their hands on these riches. I take this helicopter and it drops me in this town. And as the helicopter's landing, this, everybody in the, in the little village is running to the landing strip. I'm looking down, watching these people looking up, wondering what, 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 who's coming, what's happening. And I get deposited in this place and there's not another flight and, until the next week. So I step off with my backpack, my transmitting equipment, my computer, some spare batteries, a few power bars, and I'm gonna spend the next week in this town trying to write about what's happening and transmit it back so it can run on the front pages of the New York Times. That is journalism. That is what you're training to do. It's that exciting. It's, it's this, this privilege to take these adventures for a higher purpose. We're not talking about cheap thrills. Journalism, when it's done, is done to help people. It's done to shed light on, on injustices, on inequalities, on abuses, abuses of power, crimes, violence. And if you're doing your job well, you're generating empathy. I like to say we are in the empathy generation business. You are trying to get people to care about others. When I took those risks to go into Congo to see this town that was falling apart in front of my eyes, to take these helicopters to far-flung places and expose myself to a lot of risk. I was doing that because I cared about what was happening and I wanted the world to care. And I was lucky enough to work for a big paper that had the resources to send me to these places and bring this news out. Now, there's often immense power and impact you can have. Some of the stories I did in Africa and in India have, have changed people's lives for the better. One of the stories I'm proudest was uh, about sexual violence in Congo, how there was this epidemic of, of really violent, brutal rapes being inflicted on women across a wide swath of this area. It was a symptom of government failure, of, of a collapse of, of law and order, of pure chaos, nobody in control, men with guns and power having their way with women and really hurting them and terrorizing them and coming into villages and abusing any, any, any woman from 80 years old, any female from 80 years old to little girls who were two or three being gang raped by these madmen. And I went to these areas, which are dangerous, even for, even for anybody. And I wrote stories about what was happening. I wrote about the doctors who were risking their lives to work in these hospitals. I wrote about the women who were victimized sometimes twice or three times by different groups. I tried to get in touch with people who were fighting in these groups to understand the mentality and the psychology of why were they doing this to, to, the, to their fellow human beings. And we did a big front page story about this in the New York Times that ran, out, ran on a Sunday, which is like the best day for a story to run because that's when we have the most readers. And the day that story ran, my, my email inbox was flooded with requests for help. People saying, I just read your story. I want to help. How can I help that doctor? How can I help that woman? What can I do sitting here 
in, in New York or Paris or London or wherever <laughs> that person happened to be reading the story. How can I help? Tom, I think your, your microphone is still on. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, so that's a big part of why we take these risks. It's exciting as hell to be parachuted into these conflict zones and to live on your wits and to try to read a situation really quickly and capture the drama and the energy and the emotion and the sense of being on history's front lines. There's, there's history being made all the time in India and in Africa and the United States, politically, socially, at times with these conflicts, with protests. Sometimes it's very dramatic, sometimes it's incremental, but that's our job as journalists to be witnesses. We're sitting in the front rows watching this, this, this history being made right in front of us. And it's us that's transmitting that to the public who can't get into that frontline seat. But, but we're also doing it to, to, to help others. And I'm most, I'm, I'm proudest of the work that I did that did that. I, I covered the Ebola epidemic in 2014, which in a way was a taste of what we're dealing with with coronavirus. It was the first time that there was this horrible disease that was spreading faster than anybody could control going across international borders and creating a sense of panic. Now, Ebola is, is a much more vicious and, and, and horrible disease than coronavirus. But a lot of the, the containment efforts were the same, shutting down towns, blocking people's access, quarantining people, anybody who gets sick gets separated, trying to prevent the, the transmission. And I went to Sierra Leone, which was in the throes of thousands of people dying from, from Ebola. And another skill of journalists is zeroing in on the story. There's so much noise, so much confusion, so many different things are happening at once in these big dramatic events. And you have to figure out often very quickly, what is the, the thing you wanna focus on? What is the most dramatic moving story you can tell at that moment? So I went to an orphanage. I went to a place where there were hundreds of kids who had lost both parents to Ebola. And some of them were, were little children with nobody to take care of them because their entire families had been decimated by this disease. And there was this one little girl whose nickname was Sweetie Sweetie. And she had an, an amazing, almost impossible to believe story where her family, her father had died of, of Ebola. Her brothers and sisters had died of Ebola. Her mother got very sick with Ebola and there was nobody except this little girl and her mother in her house. And the mother was taken to a hospital and the little girl insisted on coming. And she stayed in this quarantine center where everybody was sick with this horrible disease. Everybody was dying around her. Her mother was dying in front of her. She insisted on helping feed her mother, wash her clothes, take care of her. This girl is four years old. She's up to my waist. She can barely talk. And she's playing this role as a caregiver. And then her mother dies. And when the mother dies, the people running this quarantine center have no idea what to do with this little four-year-old girl who just happened to be here. And she steps and they, and they have her leave and she steps outside gates and she's waiting for somebody to pick her up and take her home. And she ends up in the hands of this orphanage that's totally overwhelmed with all these children who've lost their parents and have this stigma that they're the Ebola kids. Nobody wants to, to, to adopt them or to help them. So I wrote a story about this and the reaction again was, was, was immense. Hundreds of people wanted to help. They wanted to adopt her. They wanted to send her money. They wanted to pay for her education. Just because I had chosen to focus my story on her, her life was changed. She was, she was adopted. Several people sent money to, to pay for her school all the way through college. She had a totally transformed life because of, of our story. And that's what I feel proudest of. That's, those are the really gratifying moments in this career. And I, I, just, I just want you guys to see that that's, that's the road you're on. You're training to be a journalist. You're going to have the opportunities to, 
to make a difference. In India too, I've done a lot of work I'm very proud of. When the pandemic hit, one of the biggest stories we did was about child labor and how all these children who had been in school in India, many poor kids, some of them had been doing really well in school, first generation to go to school. Their parents were illiterate, everybody in their community older than, than them was uneducated, and they had been lucky enough to be swept up into school, and some of them were doing really well. And when the pandemic hits and their schools close, guess what happens? They get put to work. And so I traveled to, to Southern India, to Tamil Nadu, and I followed these kids around who had been in school just a few months before, who are now scavenging for garbage, looking for recyclable plastic, carrying around these sacks on their backs from, from dawn till dusk for uh, you know 50 rupees a day or something, very little. And I found one kid named Rahul, 11 year old kid, clearly bright. I tracked down his teacher. His teacher said this kid was one of the smartest in his class excellent memory, very expressive, high vocabulary, high IQ. And he was at risk of losing his education forever because his parents needed the money, the school was closed and they put him to work. So we did this big piece about Rahul. This was just last year. You can find it in the New York Times. You can search my name and Rahul and child labor and you'll see it. And the, the instant that story ran, Again, so many people wrote into us wanting to help him, wanting to help all these kids, millions of them around, around the world. India has a child labor, his, has a history of child labor, but so do many other developing countries where kids are denied an education and they're put to work. And so that's the type of work you guys can do as journalists. Now, you're not going to start off flying to Congo. You're going to start small. You will finish school, you will most likely work in a small office, or you'll have a small job in a big office. You will sit through boring meetings. You will be asked to do things that seem beneath your intelligence. At the same time, you will be confused. On one of my first days at work in Wisconsin, I worked my butt off just to get this internship in Kenosha, Wisconsin, at a very small paper. And that's another thing about journalism. Any, any career that trades on talent is very hard to break into. It was harder getting that job at this Kenosha, Wisconsin newspaper than it was getting hired at the New York Times because I was an unknown quantity. Nobody, nobody I had no track record. I'd done some student journalism, but I'd never had a full, full-time paying job and nobody wanted to take a risk on me. So I got this job, summer internship, and I'll never forget this. One of my first days on the, on the job, there was this funny little story about a bunch of ducks that got stuck in the middle of an interstate highway, a six lane highway, thundering traffic in this small group of ducks, some mommy duck and a daddy duck and some ducklings in the middle of the highway, didn't know which way to go and traffic had ground to a halt all around it. And we heard about this on a police radio. So the city editor turns to me and he says, Jeff, give me two graphs on the ducks. And I'm like, two graphs? Like a pie graph, a bar graph? I had no idea what, what he was talking about. And I asked a colleague, I said, well, what does he mean two graphs? And the colleague laughed. He said, paragraphs. Give him two paragraphs. So you're going you're gonna to have experiences where, where you're going to have to kind of fake it until you make it. And you're going to have to pay your dues. If you're serious about journalism, you're going to start small and you're going to cover a lot of unglamorous things and you have to do it with humility and respect. You will take notes that you barely can read. You will have a few hours to explain something that people have spent their lifetime immersed in. You will have a ton of stress on you. You will have to report, understand, conceptualize, and then write cleanly, accurately, and with some flair in just a few hours. So much of our work is done on deadline. That's a huge part of the job. 
What can you, you know, a bomb blows up, a plane crashes, a town in Congo falls, some horrible crime happens. And people want to know about that, especially in today's fast paced, internet based, mobile phone based world. People want to know now. And you're going to go back to your office or be in the field on your phone or with your laptop. And you're going to have a few minutes to construct this story. And that, and that stress can be exciting. Some people don't deal with it, but, but it can be exciting. It can be, you know, you can, you can see it as stepping up to the plate. We use the American metaphor for baseball, but, but, but putting yourself on the spot and seeing how you perform. It sounds scary, but it builds immense self-confidence and strength. As the days pass, you will get more opportunities. If you stay in journalism and you work your way up, you will begin to venture into new worlds. You will start by meeting people in your communities that you've never met before. People in different walks of life, people in neighborhoods or, or lines of work or at socioeconomic levels that you wouldn't otherwise have an excuse to meet. But journalism is your excuse. It's like a passport, not just to not just to travel geographically, but to travel socially and politically and, you know, across the full range of human experience, you will meet really rich people in their, in their homes and in their offices, really successful people, really famous people. And you will meet people that are struggling to get through the day, to feed their families, to survive, that don't know what's going to happen when night falls. That's all part of the job. And that's why I say it's such a wonderful job. It is a, a job that taps into the full range of being a human being. And you have this excuse because again, you're on that, you're given that front row seat. Your mission is to take in all this information, all this news, all this drama, all this history and share it with the world. And not many people get to sit in that front row seat. Your stories will get better. You will read great books and you will emulate the writing. You will try different styles. One day you might be Ernest Hemingway when you write. And Ernest Hemingway wrote very short sentences. Not a lot of detail, not a lot of adjectives, not a lot of emotion. He was brusque. He was almost undramatic to a, to a, to a, to a fault. Very sparse. But he, he changed the way... He was a journalist and, and he changed the way literature was, was pursued. He brought, he brought a, a kind of directness and a, a muscularity and a, 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 a sense of, of, of life and, and, and without, without the flourishes, but just the, the juice of life to his work. So one day you could try to write like him. The next day you can write like William Faulkner or Salman Rushdie, a, a writer who's really rich and, and, and florid and descriptive and sensual, long sentences, lots of adjectives, lots of images, lots of metaphors. You can try writing like that. You will get sharper at expressing yourself. And that's a key part of any job, especially journalism, not just discussing events, but discussing what it feels like to be in those events, to share the feelings of others so people care, so they're moved. You will travel. You will travel by all means, by car, by bus, by motorcycle, by boat, by planes, by trains, by military transport. I think I've been to 80 countries or 90 countries by now. And I get a thrill every time I step off a plane in a new place and look around for the first time. I don't care what kind of story it is. It's exciting just to walk down the steps of that plane and be in a new, a new world. You will be forced to think and defend yourself on the spot, sometimes on almost zero sleep in the middle of the night. But you will be doing something that you believe in. And that's a really important point. Some of you may not choose to, to stick with journalism. That's okay. 
at 18, 19, 20 years old, it's hard to know exactly what you want to do in life. And some advice I, I give to you is do not feel pressure to put yourself in a corner to define yourself too early. Part of growing up is figuring out what you like, what you're good at, what you care about. But that's, do not give up on that. Because when you find something you believe in, it, it, it changes your life. You can look the world in the eye. You can put in those long hours. Journalism has some grueling hours. Great personal risk. You guys just read about the Reuters photographer who was killed in Afghanistan. I, I was friends with that guy. He was one of the best photographers India has produced. His pictures from the Northeast Delhi riots and of the Rohingya, some of the biggest stories that we've witnessed in the last couple of years were the best pictures anybody had, had shot. And he just paid for his work with his life. This, is, this can be a dangerous job. But you have to believe in yourself, and that's what gets you through it. And most people, you know, don't be too scared. Most people don't have an experience like that. But there are hard times. And if you believe in your work, it will get you through those hard times. There's also a set of skills that you learn as a journalist that you're going to learn starting your course that are transferable to any career. So if you want to switch into law or business or technology, marketing, writing on your own, going into entertainment, being an artist, anything, the skills you learn as a journalist are really critical to so many other professions, communicating, both speaking and writing crisply, sharply, expressively. That is key to so many jobs, success, listening. That's like the number one thing we do as a journalist. Just listen, get somebody to open up, tell you about their work themselves, their fears, their dreams, and just stop talking and listen. That's an immense skill to absorb that information, to store it, to remember it, to be able to work off it in a conversation. And this, this idea, too, of being in an alien environment and having to learn fast, translate fast, decode fast, that is priceless. Now, I want to talk a little bit before I'm done about your school. And, you, you know, first, you're very lucky to be in school, in a really good school. There are, there are you know, young people around the world that are dying to go to university full time or, or participate fully in the university and that will never get the opportunity. And some of those kids are really smart and just won't get the shot. And you're studying at a, at a place with a great reputation that's getting better by the day. And you have professors that have practiced this craft. The, the, the two on this call, Tom and, and, and Kish, they're both experienced veteran journalists at the highest levels of the, of the game. And they know what it's like to work for a uh, top quality media. And so I would, I would just encourage you to be as respectful and as humble and as open-minded as you can. I know it's easy when you're younger to think you know it all. I definitely did. I was so eager to get out of the box and be sent off to Africa or overseas right away. And it's a good thing I didn't because I learned a lot from, from my elders, from people who had done the work years more than I had. And I really want you to, to be open to that. Don't take, don't take shortcuts. There's a, there's a lot of freedom in university and some kids abuse that. Don't, don't cheat. Don't plagiarize. Don't do, don't, don't, you're just shortchanging yourself. It's like I think of the metaphor of running around a, a, a track or a practice field before playing sports. I, I played sports as a kid, and often we'd have to run around the field several times as a, as a warm up or as a, a way to get in better shape. And if you cut the corners on the field, you're only cheating yourself. You're, you're just denying yourself that opportunity to get in better shape. You're running a little less than everybody else. And so you're going to be in a little less good shape. Don't do that. Push yourself. Now, there's also this fallacy that 
good writing and good journalism, you know, are these inherent skills, these naturally born skills, these things that either, you know, you're given or you're not. You're either a great writer or you're not. You can't learn these things. A lot of people believe that. I don't. You can learn to be a really good writer. It, there, there are certain techniques of, of, of using verbs, leaning on the verbs, of, of picking your adjectives carefully, of mixing up the rhythms of your sentences, of trying to write dramatically, yet with some, some intelligence and some nuance. You can learn all that and you will be a stronger journalist because of it. And like I said, you'll be able to bring that to anything you do from here on out. Reading is really important. You got to read good writing. You're, what you read is, is you only have so much time in your day or your week to just dedicate yourself to reading. And especially today with the temptations of looking online, it's hard to slow down and just absorb a good book. I know it sounds so old fashioned listening to it coming out of my mouth, but it's true. You have to give yourself time to read good literature, good nonfiction writing, good magazine writing. It, it's out there. And, and the more you read and the more you kind of deconstruct how these stories are told, the, the better journalist and writer you will be. The final thing I want to say is that this is a really important time to be a journalist in India. You guys are training to be journalists in one of the most important countries in the world, the world's biggest democracy, the world's, you know, one of the most culturally important countries in the world, one of the most economically important countries in the world, a place with a very unique history that I've been lucky enough to, to learn a bit about. India needs good journalists. It needs people who, who care about going, you know, holding the powerful to account, about penetrating different layers of society and telling stories, about experiencing India and, and looking for the, the most important, most dramatic, most meaningful stories you can tell. There, there's so many. We focus a lot on politics and governance, and that's important because journalists are often holding the powerful to account in any culture, especially a democracy. You are given that license. If your government, municipal government, state government, central government is doing something that is not right, and these people have been put into office by, by the public, they are using public taxpayer money for their, their operations. They are doing something, abusing their power, doing something wrong, not, not living up to their the expectations. It is very important to bring that to light. But that's just one side of journalism. There's also social issues between men and women and children and adults and different, different layers of society, caste, race, religion that need to be told. There's really important stories about the environment in India that need to be told. India is a spectacularly beautiful country with amazing wildlife, amazing nature, and there's such pressures on it more than any other country in the world. I spent a lot of time in Africa writing about wildlife and the natural world, and there are pressures there too, but nothing like India. You have these endangered tigers, the most spectacular animals on the planet ever created. And, and right next to the tiger reserves are highways and villages and factories. And, and, and every day there's more people and more industry and more pollution and more, more and the animals are, are struggling with this. People are struggling with this. These stories are really important. And India's role in the world, India's connection to other countries, to China, to Pakistan, it's, it's, it's weight in Asia and its connections to the US and Europe. Every day, India is getting stronger and more powerful and more important. And so your work is, is, is that much more important. So I just wanna leave it with you guys that I think you're in a, in a wonderful spot. You're at a, 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 a very important school and you're pursuing something that can deliver you a really exciting, meaningful life where you can help people and you can 
live these dreams that you've had to explore and to experience. And it won't be easy, but if you believe in what you're doing, and if you search hard to find something that you believe in, it will carry you through those hard moments. And so I wish you the, the best of luck as you start. And I want you to start like as sharp and focused as you can be. And I just hope you guys can find a, a path in journalism that delivers you everything you had hoped for. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thanks, Jeffrey. Lovely to hear you. I think you missed out on one of the modes of conveyance when he was talking about boats and uh, buses and auto rickshaws. There's, I mean, he did Africa. I did parts of, uh, you know, forested India. And one of the modes of conveyance I remember was an elephant. Um, we had to take an elephant to cross certain parts. Uh, and I remember my accounts officer in Delhi wouldn't sign off on the bill because he said, I can't sign off on a bill of, uh, you know, of you traveling on an elephant. I mean, there's no such, you know, budget head for elephants. So, you know, these are, these are interesting things that the journalist goes through it. And as, as Jeffrey says, um, you know, uh, students that we are all storytellers, but journalists get paid to tell stories and very often than not those stories can change lives. And I think it's worth then taking a chance to tell a story that can change lives. So thanks, Jeffrey, once again. And uh, uh, you catch your breath. Questions are already coming in. But before that, um, I'd like to request our registrar, Professor Sridhar Patnaik, uh, to make his remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Kish. And I fully agree with you. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the lecture by uh, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, it's truly invigorating. It's so very passionate. Uh, he's an amazing uh, narrator and a master storyteller uh, as well. And there is a certain method to what he had mentioned. And uh, that's the most important message to all of our students uh, who joined the program this year at the School of Journalism and Communication. And uh, not just to them, but uh, whosoever uh, join the lecture, be it our uh, uh, existing students of the School of Journalism and Communication and uh, students belonging to uh, other schools as well, if they had joined the lecture, uh, because there are so many takeaways. It's not just about uh, what a journalist does, uh, what a journalist ought to do, uh, but his work and lived experiences uh, symbolizes uh, many aspects that one needs to do as much as a journalist can get benefited uh, by their training in uh, different disciplines, uh, others can also get benefited on uh, the method of writing and the method of conveying a message. So uh, these are some of the most important uh, takeaways. And uh, the other important message to me, uh, well, I'm so thrilled to listen to Jeffrey. So uh, uh, what I can say uh, based on his uh, life and experiences is, uh, one can take a leaf or two uh, out of uh, uh, Jeffrey's experiences and whatever uh, he studied, uh, be it in terms of uh, philosophy, law, journalism, and whatever work he did, uh, be it uh, with the local communities or even uh, covering the war zones and matters even rela in, relating, uh, in relation to uh, international uh, affairs. Uh, so this is what... Uh, uh, the uh, life and work of a, of, a, of a journalist is. And this is exactly the kind of a training uh, which our students of uh, BA Honours in Journalism and Communication uh, can expect at the OP Jindal Global University. Uh, one thing which is very important, uh, probably uh, being at the JSJC, which is uh, the J School of Journalism and Communication, and JGU, uh, can give our students uh, the uh, gumption and also the uh, expertise in different areas uh, because uh, all those matters that uh, Jeff touched upon, uh, one can gain uh, knowledge and uh, insightful expertise on those areas, uh, be it in the field of law or be it in the field of uh, uh, public policy or uh, international affairs uh, from our schools at uh, JGU. 
but uh, you are certainly going to know all of that and much more uh, in the days and uh, months to come. Uh, but the other most uh, fascinating aspect of uh, uh, Jeff's life and career is that uh, his uh, combination of uh, uh, degree areas, uh, journalism with philosophy, and I might be a lay person and I haven't heard much about uh, journalists as philosophers, uh, but today I'm so fortunate that I had come across uh, uh, Jeffrey and probably that is another very important method and a way of life, uh, which our students can uh, imbibe and even take uh, inspiration from, uh, because we need to have good philosophers as well as journalists, because fundamentally, uh, they can interpret the life and society around. Uh, so that's it for the moment. Uh, but but nonetheless, uh, uh, once again, I repeat an important message to all of our students as to what they can expect from being at the School of Journalism and Communication at the JGU. And there will be many more uh, that they can learn and uh, acquire from um, uh, some of the most thoughtful and articulate uh, faculty members uh, from the JSGC. Uh, covering varieties of areas and also from other schools. And uh, to help you induct you all, uh, we already arranged uh, a pre-semester immersion training and engagement program, uh, which will be followed by a university uh, resource orientation uh, before you go on to begin your classes on uh, 16th of August in an online manner. But there's much more uh, that you need to do and uh, take advantage from your presence uh, here. And I wish you all the very best. And I also uh, take this opportunity uh, to sincerely thank uh, Jeffrey uh, for that uh, very inspiring talk. I learned a lot. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sridhar. And um, Jeffrey, let's start with the questions because some of the questions are already here. And I mm -hmm. request the audience to type in the questions uh, if you're watching the show. And um, I will be picking up your questions and tell reading them out to Jeffrey. So Jeffrey, the first question is from one of our students, uh, Tushar Verma, who says, how do you deal with the memories and experiences you had in exceptionally distressed situations, especially when you know uh, not all the stories will get the same traction? That's a really good question. God, I don't think I would have had the maturity <laughs> at your age to ask that. Um, I think it's a really hard thing absorbing other people's tragedies and suffering and not letting it, you know, not letting it make you not, not, not feeling sad, not feeling depressed. It's hard. I mean, I've, I've been in situations where people are, are hurt or dying or in tremendous fear and I can't help them. I wrote about a case in, in, in about the Rohingya, uh, one of the, the saddest stories that I've ever covered about a woman who had her baby ripped out of her arms and killed right in front of her. And after talking to her for hours and trying to, to absorb her story so I could share it with the world and kind of grab the world by its shoulders and make them care about what was happening with the Rohingya, I was just overcome with this sense of feeling useless and helpless. Like, you know, I just put her through this traumatic experience of reliving this horrible, most horrible thing somebody can survive. And, you know, what, what's the purpose? But the purpose is that you're trying to stop injustices. And one way to stop an injustice is to shed light on it and get people to think about it and get policymakers to care about it. Um, I've learned to compartmentalize and not to, and to go on with my life. I have a, a, a loving family and two kids and a great marriage. And that helps to have the full three-dimensional life behind you, not just going into this world alone, but relying on people for support, whether it's your parents or your siblings or your friends. So that's really important. Um, but it's hard. And, 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 and one other thing I didn't, I didn't mention, but I think it's a good, good thing to keep in mind um, there's a big overlap between journalism and a lot of other careers. And, and one I didn't mention was government or public policy. I know a lot of journalists who then went into politics or policy or international affairs. 
a lot, it's, a, it's many of the same skills, reading, researching, interviewing, thinking deeply about these topics, communicating them in a, in a sharp way that people can relate to. So again, don't feel like you have to have it all figured out. You're going to get a great education and great practice and great training. And you're going to have people who are really wise and experienced to turn to. Use that and then decide what you want to do with it. And you'll, and you'll, and you'll find the best fit. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, I, this is not a <clears throat> question, but um, a compliment by our dean of uh, the policy school, Professor Sudarshan. Professor Sudarshan says, I wish I could study in JSJC and embark on a career in journalism after Jeffrey's absolutely inspirational lecture. What a tour de force to borrow the vice chancellor's oft used phrase. Um, so uh, yeah, I wish uh, uh, Sudarshan could join us here. Um, he, he, and he's always been uh, a loyal uh, participant uh, for our lectures. Thanks Sudarshan for being there. Um, the next question is another student, Diptang Shukashyap, uh, who wants to do, uh, I know that Diptang Shu wants to cover war, uh, and uh, he studied films in his uh, semester break. Uh, he asks, how difficult was it for you to communicate with the people, especially when there was almost no one who could speak English? Yep. It's a, no, it's a very good question. Um, Often we work with translators or interpreters. Often we're not alone. Uh, it's fun working as a team. And in broadcast journalism, it's, it's almost always as a team. You have a cameraman, you have a field producer sometimes. Our, our job as newspaper reporters can be a little more solitary, uh, especially if you're in your, your home country. But you learn a lot that way. You learn a lot when you come into a room or into a town or into a setting and it's just you. You're very vulnerable. You know, you're facing a crowd or you're facing a group of people and you're the outsider. Um, I speak Swahili, the uh, key Swahili uh, language in East Africa. I had studied that when I was your age and I got really into it and, and really enjoyed breaking the, those barriers, breaking the ice with people, surprising people to say, you know, yeah, you know, Mimi Nim Wendishi Wahabari Kutoka America. You know, now ways of who Swahili. You know, I'm a journalist from America. I can speak Swahili, and people would just be so surprised. You know, in some settings, to see you know a foreigner able to speak like that. In India, I didn't. I didn't pick up Hindi. I. I my job as the bureau chief in in, in South Asia is covering this huge chunk of the world: India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and. And, and, and other countries in South Asia and India itself is so important and creates so much news that I did not have time to study Hindi. And that's like my biggest regret. So I was relying a lot on the, on the, on the reporters that I work with. But the, 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 the flip side was the office we have in India with experienced Indian journalists. I learned like we work together. We're a team. If you look back at our biggest stories of the last few years since I've been bureau chief, they're all multiple bylines, team efforts. We were like a swarm attacking a big story, you know, whether it was Kashmir or the CAA riots or Northeast Delhi riots or politics or elections or the pandemic. Like we, you know, very few stories I wrote on my own and we did it. I, I you know, these people were as smarter, smarter than I am and Indian. And so I was able to do a lot. I have experience telling stories but they have a lot of experience in India and as journalists. So that communication is very important. Don't let me undersell that. But there are ways to still do your work as a team if you don't have the specific language facility. There is um, another question. Jeff's experiences are realistic and thought provoking. My question, while writing on environment wrongs and conflicts, is it hard to report and move on or you end up doing something about it? Uh, it's from Maulika Arabi. She's a legal advisor of the WWF India, World Wildlife Fund India. 
You know what? That's that's a very good question. There are there are times, and I'm sure Tom and and Kish have felt this, where you don't want to be a spectator. You want to be an actor. You don't you don't like that 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 role as a journalist where you're in that front row seat, but you're still on the sidelines. You're not in the in the arena. And there are times as journalists where you think, well, I could do a better job than these guys, or I want to follow up on this cause. If it's a wildlife cause and you find yourself passionate about protecting the environment or the animals in it, you might think to yourself, maybe I should just do this. Maybe I should work as an advocacy director or communications director for an NGO or a, or a UN agency. That's fine. Like I say, people go back and forth between journalism and other professions. The skills you learn are, are really valuable. And if you can get good at them, you're going to have a lot of doors open to you to, to be in different, to be successful in different careers. So I don't, I believe in the, I, for me, journalism allowed me to bring together lots that I really wanted to do. I wanted to travel. I wanted to write. Writing has always been important to me. I wanted to do some good for the world. And I have different interests. I'm interested in the environment. I'm interested in politics. You know, I care about about human suffering. I, I found India fascinating. I find Africa really interesting. I've been in the Middle East. So it, it's you have a kind of choice. Do you want to be a specialist and, and put a lot of your career in one direction? Or do you want to move from topic to topic and place to place? Um, you'll have that choice. But, but I think that fundamental question of when do you feel the frustration of being a spectator? When do you want to be part of the advocacy is a good one to figure out because you don't want to blend them. You don't want to be a journalist whose credibility is respected because you're trying to be objective. Objectivity is, none of us are purely objective. We have our experiences, our biases, our backgrounds. But I like to say, you don't have to be, you know, you, you shouldn't be so stone cold that you can't be emotionally involved in a story. Be objective, but don't be emotionally neutral. You don't have to be emotionally neutral. You can show when you're feeling outraged by an injustice as a journalist, but don't take sides. That's why people respect our work, because they feel like we don't have an agenda. My agenda isn't pro-India, isn't pro-Pakistan. So when I write about the conflict between the two, both sides can respect the work. They see me as pro-India or pro-Pakistan, then you just you, you damage your own credibility. Same with, an, with a cause. If your cause is saving the environment, if your cause is protecting, is advancing a certain agenda, people may doubt your work. And, and that's the choice you're going to have to ultimately make. Okay, I, I think our vice chancellor has a question for you before I go to the other questions. Raj. Uh, uh, thank you, Jeff, for a fascinating uh, and truly inspiring journey. What an extraordinary journey. I was deeply inspired to hear your stories and all the sort of life's experiences that you've had. Thank you very much for sharing it with us. So Jeff, I wanted to ask you a question about something that has been a matter of huge concern um, for a lot of people from a standpoint of professional journalism. This is about the role of personal ideology and to what extent personal ideology shapes your own thinking and processes leading to reporting. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this with the context of, let's say, the time, where the, the, the situation in the run-up to the elections when President Trump got elected and how the larger political and civil society discourse, including media discourse, was in one direction. And finally, what happened was something different. And arguably, the same thing can be said about India, too, where the liberal dilemmas or liberal biases shaping the narratives in media, which may somewhat be disconnected to what the people may actually end up thinking. So how does a journalist who is objective, who is rational, who is honest, who is, has integrity, but how does one go about it in reporting uh, in that kind of a scenario? 
That's a very, very tough question and a really good question. And I think the parallels between India and the U.S. and the political environment and the media establishment are is, is totally apt because the media tends to be progressive, tends to have a kind of certain profile, right? Let's be honest. Um, and, and that's not always the same ideology as, as, the, as, the, as the dominant political party. And so you have this, this tension. Um, I think it's just really important to have humility and respect. So let's say personally, I don't agree with a certain political standpoint. I should still try to understand that position, even if it's not my position or my family's position. Even if I don't agree with it, I should try to understand it. And as a journalist, you have to leave your personal feelings uh, and, your, and your political preferences aside. And it, Raj, your question is connected in a way to that previous question, which is from the WWF uh, advocate, you know, when do you want to, when, when should you engage in advocacy? I think you have to make that decision. If you believe so strongly in your political views that you can't tolerate the other side, then you should join the, the you should step into the arena and fight for what you believe in. But if you feel like you can kind of wall it off a little bit, not take it personally, be able to interact with anybody from any political persuasion, you know, walk into a room and be able to hear things that are very different from what you believe in, but you will faithfully recreate those. I think that's a very good skill. And in, politi- in the political environment, there's, it's so polarized right now. Um, People are not even, they're not listening to each other. They're not trying to understand each other. College campuses, you know this better than I do because this is your, your, your life. Trying to foster an environment where you're listening to each other and not trying to shut each other out is getting harder. And I think that's, 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 that's a risk because especially when you're young and you're exposed to all these different views on your campus, for the students listening to this, there's going to be people from so many different backgrounds, communities, walks of life, political ideologies. It's a great opportunity. Life gets more narrow as you go up. As you get older, you find yourself in a workplace or in a community that is, is less representative of the wider world. That's what happens. You know, I went to public schools. It's a real cosmopolitan mix. You go to a university, it's a little less because everybody's had to test in and, and, and do well in school to get into the university. You get a job at a, at, a, at a big company, it's even filtered some of that out because everybody's had to work hard and be responsible, blah, blah, blah. So university is a great place to hear different yeah. viewpoints. And I, think, and I think just I urge you students to have those debates, but don't shut off. Just don't be like, I'm right, you're wrong. Just say, hey, listen, we have a different way of looking at this. And I want to understand so I can strengthen my argument to hear what yours is. Thank you, Jeff, because uh, in fact, uh, the Indian context is very important here because a lot of discourse has been on the intolerance of the right. But uh, I must say that there is enough intolerance of the left in India, too. And that's something that has been less talked about. And I think it's important to say that. Thanks, Raj. Uh, Jeff, there's another question from a student, uh, Kashish Bansal, who says, Sir, when you talk how your stories helped people like Rahul and that orphan girl, but the story you focus on gets replaced with another story, how do you deal with this situation? Uh, I I think, yeah, I know what she she means. Uh, We face that in the newsroom so often where your fighting with your news editor to get space, right? Uh, on the, at the Sunday front page, NYT is not always when you get space uh, for a story. So what do you do when, when you're facing that situation? You got, you got to have resilience, first of all. And I think that's another really important quality that all students should aspire to and the school should aspire to, to imbuing is you got to roll with the punches. You're going to face setbacks you got to get tough and you're not always going to get what you want. Often as a young person, you've had a pretty easy path. We've all had it. I had it, you know, where you kind of did well in school and you got to a good university and you don't face a lot of adversity. 
And then you hit the real world and it's like you ran into a cement ball because you can't get your way through. You know, there's a lot of competition and it's, it's people don't, you know, it's full of rejection. And so I think that's a big part of the learning process is dealing with rejection, dealing with setback. Now, with, with the placement of stories and the lifespan of a story, you're absolutely right. You have this big hit. It's wonderful. Everybody's talking about it. And the next day or the next hour, there's another big story. And people have moved on. Um, that's the trade-off with mass media. You are hitting lots of people at once with your work. Millions of people are reading the words that I've just typed when I'm doing a big story for the New York Times. That's cool. You know, if you're on TV for NDTV or another big media, lots of people are watching you. But then that attention is going to shift somewhere else. And so you have to be okay with that. You're part of the churn. You're part of this fluid dynamic in society where our attention is constantly shifting, looking around, looking around. But you do a good job. It stays to some degree in people. I, I, I've, I've had people write me and say, oh, I remember that story you did from years ago. Or if you've actually changed the lives of people, that is a, that's permanent. Their life is forever better because of that work you did. And then I chose to write this book, Love Africa, which I would love for students. You can find it on Amazon in India. And, and yeah, there you go, man. It's got a great cover. I can take no credit for that. But I talk a lot about my life, sort of trying to figure it out as a young person, trying to balance the romantic love that I had with my wife and the, the, the mischief and all the misadventure that I was feeling you know, up to as a young man, trying to find my way, and then trying to find my way through journalism, a profession that I really cared about and believed in. Um, you're going you're gonna to struggle with all these different things. But I think it's really important to, to, to know that some things you do are going are gonna to stick with people, other things are not. I chose to write that book because I wanted to leave something behind that was a little more permanent than a passing news story. Um, but again, the same skills, same skills, telling stories, doing research, presenting information in an engaging way that's easy to absorb. That's what a good book is doing. That's what a good newspaper story is doing. That's what a good broadcast is doing. Magazine story. It's all the same set of skills. Yeah, you know, I remember when this, with this question, Jeff, that for a long time, I was called the 9 a.m. reporter instead of the 9 p.m. reporter because of the uh, areas that I reported from, because it wasn't, you know, India is very metrocentric. And so, you know, I mean, a lot of stories come from Delhi and Bombay. And if you're reporting from, you know, jung jungles of somewhere, and uh, the whole fight was that, okay, unless the toll is double figure that you know you can't get on the headline it is pathetic to think of but you know it was like i mean you, know, you couldn't say you couldn't wait to say all right let 10 people die then i'm going to be on a 9 p.m thing but you got to fight i think i think newsroom is like full of sharks and you need to uh, know how to deal with that uh, on a daily basis uh, there is um, the two questions from fateh veer singh gura i'm not sure uh, whether fateh is one of our students or not but i'll take one of your questions fateh how can freelance journals ensure their safety amid a deteriorating environment for journalism, given that freelance journal, journals have literal, literally zero legal cover but produce extremely important work? I think, yeah, that's an important question in today's world, right? I think that's a great question. I think that's a great question. I've been lucky that I had a big organization behind me. I, I've been kidnapped by, by militants in Iraq. I was... Uh, thrown in prison in Ethiopia for a week. I've had some really scary things happen to me. Uh, and it's like, I talk about them in a sort of conversational, casual way, but it, they could have easily not worked out. And you'd be having a different commencement speaker at this moment. <laughs> um, but that's, that's a benefit of being part of an organization is you have an institution that's behind you. If you don't have that, and like you said, there's a lot of really important work done by freelancers. You have to be more of a team player and make sure you're communicating with people, uh, colleagues or others around you 
So if you don't have an organization formally, you have an informal community that's looking after you, you don't ever want to go into a dangerous situation with nobody knowing where you just went. I kind of use the, the metaphor of like leaving a trail of breadcrumbs, like this, this German fairy tale, Hansel and Gretel to find their way out of the forest. You got to leave a trail of where you were. You should tell somebody who's not with you. I'm going to meet this person at this time in this place. Then I'm going to do this. I'm staying at this hotel because if you're on your own, you just, you just picture if you disappear, how is somebody going to come to your rescue? Begin to be, begin to figure out where you were, you know, we're not, we're, we're part of society. You have people who care about you, your parents, your friends, you know, your spouse, when you get older, that's another dimension to this work. You're taking big risks, but you don't want anything to happen to you because that's going to cause immense grief for others. So you have to be super careful. Um, but freelancers are an important route in journalism, both as writers and photographers, especially. And I think I, I wouldn't I wouldn't discourage you from from taking risks and, and pushing yourself. But, but make your own network, make your own community with students that you've met through this course or other people you know, so that there's somebody behind you if you run into any problems, big or small. You know, let's say your phone breaks. If I work for the New York Times, they'll send me a new phone. If you're a freelancer, you're going to have to have somebody help you. So, you know, it's just really good to, to look at it as you need some backup. You can't just go off on your own with, with nobody behind you. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Fateh Singh actually is, a, is a, one of my colleagues from the communication team. Um, uh, sorry, Fateh, I, I, didn't, I couldn't place you. We have three more questions that I want to take before we wrap up. And uh, let me start with one from, again, Dean Sudarshan, who had expressed his... Uh, desire to study in our journalism school after your lecture. Um, he asks, what can we do about big money taking over journalism and destroying the standards of internal excellence of the profession? You know, I, ha I have mixed feelings about big money. The New York Times is a family owned newspaper. It, it, it does a lot of great journalism. And I, and I say that as somebody who's been there for 20 years. So obviously I have my perspective, but even if I wasn't on the inside, I think it's fair to say that it provides a very important public service and brings news to a lot of people from all over the, you know, from all over the world, all levels of society. That is partly possible because there's a family that's been at the heart of that paper for generations. And, and many of, of American media at one point was owned by, by important and, and successful and wealthy families. So you can, you can decide, you know, as, 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 a, as a benefactor, you can decide how you're going to use your wealth. It can be used for good or for not. But I, I don't think having, an, having a, a wealthy family behind a media organization is necessarily a bad thing. There are corporate pressures. So some like, you know, so, some big media are now part of corporations that have to demonstrate every quarter their economic financial performance. And so they're looking for ways to cut corners, to save costs, to drive revenues. And they have a very short cycle. Like every quarter, they got to say, we're still growing. We're still making a profit. That, that can be problematic. It's more transparent in a way because it's a, it's a public corporation, but it, it has different pressures. Um, I think the key word here is integrity. The journalists from the, from the lowest, most entry-level reporter to the top editor have to do their job with integrity and, and, and not be influenced by, by, by money or by politics and just be able to face the critics who aren't going to like what you write. If, you know, there's all these stories of, of small town newspapers that would get advertisements from local businesses. So there's a big car dealership in town and they're running ads in your paper. And those ads help you pay your bills and employ your staff and do your journalism. What happens if that owner of the car dealership does something wrong? Are you not going to write about that because they're also helping support the paper? Once you go down that road, you just compromise your, your integrity. Your job is not 
to pay the bills of the newspaper. As a journalist, your job is to write what happened faithfully, accurately, without fear or favor. You're not trying to win points. You're not trying to settle scores. You're just trying to tell the, you know, the truth and to, and to provide these narratives of, of what really happened. So that's just my, my, my fallback position, which is you got every layer of the paper has to do their jobs with integrity. The next question has come from uh, Basundra Sagal. What motivates you when you have to cover an epidemic or you know uh, that your life is at risk if you're going somewhere? I guess you've already told us, but uh, you know, what motivates you? No, no. I, listen, I think it's scary to put yourself in danger. Covering the pandemic was difficult because it wasn't, you know, we, we, were, we were all so, look, look at us now, we're all in our homes, right? I mean... It, it, you know, we're, we're all so atomized and separated. And that was really hard. I got into journalism to travel, to be in the field, to experience life. I didn't get into journalism to sit on a Zoom call. And that's, you know, I, and we all are feeling this, you know, it's hard. That's not, this is a temporary moment that we all have to stomach and get through. But there's a big world out there and I'm willing to take the risks because I believe in the work and I'm, I feel excited to, to experience it and to share it with others. Um, the pandemic was hard to cover because we were so isolated from each other. It's a disease that, that, that is passed by close contact. And so the re reaction in a way has been worse than the disease of everybody retreating from each other. That's been hard, but it's temporary. We're gonna get through this uh, and anybody who's feeling frustrated and a little bit down, we're all feeling that way. And just, just hang in there. Yeah, we have time for one last question. I, I couldn't ask any questions to you. I wanted to ask you about the uneasy relationship between the Indian government and New York Times, but we will uh, do that at, at a different time. Kajori Sen, one of uh, uh, my faculty members and a colleagues pre pre in, in, in previously in journalism, she asks, historically journalists from the global north have had a unique access to conflict territories, but with that comes allegations of outsider perspectives and poverty tourism. How do you deal with that? Um, yeah. I think it's a really good point. I think we have to deal with it with respect and humility. I am an outsider. I am not a Congolese villager. I'm not somebody living in Somalia dealing with Islamist terrorists. I'm not uh, a poor Indian trying to make it or uh, a, a young man who's better off at school but finds himself scavenging for, for garbage and recyclables. I'm not that person. I am coming in from an outside perspective. But I do that with respect. And I think that's the key bit. I, I can't do it with a sense of superiority. I can't say my culture is better than your culture or I'm more privileged than you. I, I got to get rid of that. I have to do it with respect and, and, and humility and, and care and, 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 and empathy. That's why empathy is such a powerful force. If you are, are really feeling empathy towards somebody, you're going you're gonna to do all of that, what I just said. You're going to be respectful. You're going to be humble. You're going to be caring. Um, I, I, I do wish that there were more people from different countries covering each other. It would be great to have you know, Indians in Congo and Congolese covering India and not just, you know, have these foreigners that are going to both places. You know, it would be great to bring a different perspective to our news, a truly global perspective. You know, how does India see, you know, climate change? Um, how does India see America's influence in the world? How do the Middle East and Muslim countries feel about America's military activities in the Muslim world, in the Arab world? We need those perspectives. We're getting better at that, um, but there's still a dominance of, of this Western media that has these resources that a lot of places don't have. But I think we're more cognizant that that diversity of voices is really important. And if you look at the New York Times, both the news side of the type of people who are writing stories and the opinion side, the type of people who are contributing essays, it's getting more diverse uh, and it's a better, more exciting product because of that. So let me just say, I've really enjoyed talking to you guys. I have a lot of respect for what you do. Raj, you're a great leader. 
the instant I met you, I could, I could, I could feel that. And I think your, your university is, what's happening is really exciting and admirable. And um, I just want to let you guys know, I'm, I'm very proud to even have this loose connection with you. So thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for uh, this association, the loose connection. We'll try and make it, we'll try and form up this association and connection. And yes, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Raja's leadership. I'd also, uh, you know, like to invoke at this point of time that uh, the backroom uh, guys really uh, made our lives so much easier over the last one and a half years. We don't get an opportunity to, uh, you know, acknowledge them, acknowledge their efforts. They are always a very small team. Uh, the IT guys, the infrastructure guys, uh, when the pandemic started, I remember within exactly within 48 hours, 24 hours, I think hardware was moved in, software came in, people were trained and we were struggling. We didn't even know what to do. And uh, Raj was there, absolutely confident. And there were these guys moving into people's home, pushing in machines and we were all connected and we've stayed connected. I don't think so at J JGU, we've missed a single class uh, over the last three and a half semesters, which is incredible in its own way. I mean, I think that kind of resilience that the students have shown, many of the students, and when I'm saying many, I know many because I have spoken to them personally, have gone through uh, tragedies uh, in their own home, uh, if not near and dear ones, and yet they uh, you know, came and wrote their exams, uh, they attended classes. Uh, so I think it, this is a moment that I would take to also thank for the resilience of the students, the faculty, the staff, uh, and the backroom guys, um, really, really uh, thanks guys for you know, bringing us together. It, this wouldn't have been possible. Jeff wouldn't have been able to share his stories and he wouldn't have been able to hear together without any glitches. I mean, I have, dealt, I have been on a tech, technological platform all my life on television and I know what glitches mean. I mean, glitches are like an everyday situation. And out here we pulled on, you know, two graduate, two batches are graduating without a glitch. Uh, I mean, without a glitch is a bit of an oxymoron out here, but I'm talking of the technological glitch. So thank you everyone. Thank you, lovely audience. And uh, Tom, Raj, Sridhar, um, and Ashima and others, Ashish, uh, who, who are here. Like I mentioned earlier in the evening, uh, I'm really kind of, uh, you know, sometimes there's a line of a song that you keep humming and it keeps coming back to you. It's like the Olympic motto, faster, higher, stronger, together. That's because so much of Olympics happening around us. Thanks, um, and uh, everyone. And as Edward Murrow, another journalist, students you would uh, learn about, would sign off every night. Good night and good luck, and stay safe. Bye bye.